All right, welcome everybody to the space. Thank you so much for coming and attending um, to hear and be a part of this conversation um, and the knowledge that's about to be shared. But before we do, there's always something special as Indigenous people that we do to recognise where we are, who we're with, um, and acknowledging what's in front of us. So, further ado, I would like to introduce myself. My name is Natasha Nabanunga Bamblet. I'm a proud Yorta Yorta, Kurnai, Walpuri, and Wawadjuri woman. I'm a visitor on these lands. Uh, I've been living here for about seven years now on Wawandri country. Welcome, welcome everybody. And I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands of where we gather. Here in particular, very special on the Biron Ma. Uh, we have the rivers, the gums, we have the animals from the waterways all the way to the skies. And I just want to acknowledge the first peoples that have walked these lands, the continuing culture, the languages, and everything that has been lost, suppressed or damaged along the way, acknowledging the lands are still in a continuing relationship and connection, communication with people, and to be here acknowledging the future also with our communications our ways of storytelling and uh, communicating with people. I want to acknowledge Indigenous panellists here and anyone in uh, the room here today. And in my native tongue, I want to say, Te Galinyan Ganya, Neena Kaka Yao Yambina Waka, Neena Kainyambina Yakurumja, Dumanya Gumiga, Dumiga Itha Waka Nidawama Damanimalan, Mumbangara Bome Eninyan Waka. I said, hello, beautiful friends. We walk upon the land of the Aboriginal people. We thank, acknowledge and respect the Aboriginal people's land that we gather on today. Take pleasure in all the land and respect all you see. But for me, I'm going to take that one step further as our beautiful elders who do the welcome of country here. They say the word that is known throughout this place, Nam, Melbourne, is Womanjika. Womanjika, known to many as welcome. But for me, as an elder's shared story, it means to come with purpose. So I want to plant that with you all. You've come here. You've made the journey. What is the purpose? Are you coming with intention? For me, come with purpose to leave this place better than we found it and using today's technology in a way that we are continuing to collaborate with our ways of ancient being and knowledge um, and bringing that to the future of how we see through different lenses and communicate and share story. So, I'm going to invite us to all do an acknowledgement of country. So, you look very comfy in your seats there. <laughs> um, maybe let's just put your stuff in your hands to the side and we can do it seated. We'll enjoy the cinema chairs while we've got them. <laughs> all right. Hands together like this. We're going to rub them. So no matter where we are, we can continue to connect to ourselves, the people around us, and the country. We're gonna click, connecting to the sounds, the sounds that echo from the elements, like the waters. The vibrations, louder, stomp your feet. The energy your knees feeling alive and everybody take a deep breath in and go ah hands in the air take a deep breath in 
and let's go on the journey of learning from what these beautiful people have to say. So, give yourselves a big round of applause. Well done. Good start. I might hand it all the way over to the end. <laughs> yeah. You sat there for a reason, buddy. Um, hand it over to Ben. Okay. Please introduce yourself and okay. let everybody know what you do. All right. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name's Ben Armstrong. Uh, I'm a Wiradjuri man. And um, I guess I'll start off with my role. I'm very lucky to be in a new role. Um, which is the head of gaming and partnerships at Awesome Black, which is a uh, for-profit, for-purpose organization that helps creatives in lots of different industries. Um, but I have worked in technology for over 20 years. Um, I started off as, you know, that one black fella in university studying comsci, and I was that one black fella in corporate for 20 years, um, and decided to leave that because there were a lot more opportunities. But um, I guess I'm here today as part of that uh, um, journey. Um, it's part of my, you know, the the work and advocacy that I did in my last role, which was CEO of Indigitech, which is a not-for-profit for Indigenous people in the technology um, uh, industry, um, and some of the other things that I do that are kind of fun on the side. But um, that's who I am. It's a pleasure to be here. Amazing. Thank you. Yeah, excellent. All right. Catherine. Thanks, everyone. I'm Kat. Or, um, yeah, I'm Catherine Gledhill Tucker. Uh, I'm Noongar, I say writer and activist is a nice little catch all of the things that I do. Um, I lead a, an initiative at ThoughtWorks, which is a global tech consultancy to m create and nurture um, uh, careers for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander technologists. That's like by day. Uh, and then I do a lot of digital rights and privacy advocacy. I'm the vice chair of Electronic Frontiers Australia. And I have a bit of a creative practice as well, writing science fiction and a bit of poetry. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's a nice little summary. Thank cool. you. Hi, I'm Hayley. Nice to see you all. Um, I work um, in curatorial spaces within music and placemaking and major events. And I also work as a game director with a game agency studio named Guck. And we're working on um, Australia's first Aboriginal led video game mobile app. Um, the title at the moment is Future Folklore. And that's actually been penned by our game director, Jara Carolina Steele. Um, just want to acknowledge that that is her terminology. And I think, you know, the focus of the game very much leans into black and indigenous futurisms um, through a digital landscape. So it's really exciting to be here with you all. Beautiful. Give it up for the panelists. <laughs> Beautiful. I just wanted to uh, put it to the panel as what's something that you've come across, uh, feel free, I might go to Kat. Um, what have been some of the challenges when you first come into this space mm -hmm. that, um, you know, as a, coming into this space as an Indigenous woman in the lens of tech, what mm -hmm. are some of the barriers or challenges that you mm -hmm. had? I think the, the classic, like, you can't be what you can't see is, is, mm -hmm is like really pervasive is really impactful just entering spaces where you can't see yourself and you can't see like where you could grow to in five years or ten years and having to create that definition and that space for yourself without community and kind of building that community for yourself or you know finding people along the way like you know folks at Guck and in Digitech and Awesome Black um, that's we've been able to find these connections over time but when you're starting out there's there's really nothing mm. um, or at least there wasn't when I did I think Ben it was the same for you mm. um, so that's yeah I, I think it all comes back to mm. the community yeah, yeah beautiful and Ben just probably echoing some of Kat's challenges what's mm. also yeah what's driven you to, to be doing what you're doing? Ah, that's a really great question, isn't it? Um, I, I think it definitely bends off of uh, and, and really builds on what Kat was talking about. Um, but I think so. a little bit selfishly in a way, um, 
my career was a typical career in tech there was only one path for me to take mm -hmm. i had to go to university i had to do this there was no opportunity to do games design when i went to university that that was a pipe dream even though like you know i would have loved to have done it but um i think that you know there's some privilege that comes along with that for me to be in a position where i can make a choice now mm -hmm. but there's also uh, been a huge shift um, that allows us to look at different ways and, and opportunities right um, almost essentially standing on the shoulders of the people before us yeah. right so that we now have organizations like Guck and I, look by no means is that great that there's only one Guck and one awesome black and one digit, <laughs> right like there should be a lot more but um, there never was before so we're, we're building mm -hmm. and as we continue to build um, as indigenous peoples in these spaces um, you know again on the shoulders of all of the work that that, that our, that our activists and elders and everyone have, have done this gives us opportunity gives us choice um, mm -hmm. and creates different pathways for us so it allows me to turn around after you know 20 years of working in the corpo swine role that i call it <laughs> um to be able to go actually no i want to i want to go and do something in gaming i think it's really cool i love stories i love the storytelling uh, and i think that there's a lot more building to be done there and why not be a mm -hmm. part of it beautiful yeah. i love that Hayley, what's um, has been something that you've seen in your time mm -hmm. change? I think it's a really malleable process ongoing. I feel like for us, what we've seen change and evolve is that, I guess it's worth noting this project has been in discussion and conversation every day for about three and a half years. And I mean, literally every single day we speak about how to get to this outcome of this game and through that process what we've seen is that it's not just about the outcome anymore like it's actually about coming into this tech space where there is very little cultural safety there are very little organizations that you know how aboriginal led or indigenous focused or have actual cultural safety as a priority and just seeing the evolution in the time that we've been working on this project around how much consulting and time and energy goes into just getting to starting to make the game is kind of crazy. Mm -hmm. So when you say, or when you ask, you know, what have I seen change? I guess I've seen us get to a point where after three years, we can finally work on the product we were trying to work on. And I know that's not like potentially the positive change, but it mm -hmm. is a change. Like it's for me, it's a positive direction, but it is worth acknowledging that, you know, we had this idea we'll make this fun thing it'll be great and then when you start doing it realize no nothing exists in this space we have to actually build from the ground up and that is a lot of hard work mm. wow yeah thank you uh cat who if not you because you're saying that you are really coming in as almost pioneers um who is doing something out there that is almost leading in the way um or how are things being done that are leading this space? Mm. Maybe this is something we can all talk about. Yeah. It's something I think we yell mm. about a lot is, um, so it's, I mean, I, us, like honestly, I think we're doing a lot of that work, but there's uh, outside of tech and outside of mm. you know, games where strengthened by the communities and families that we come from and yeah. i think that's it's the resilience and the strength from the elders that have come before me and mm -hmm. the family that i get to go back to and make sure that i'm doing everything right and i'm following protocol like having that strength of community is really really vital to be able to do the work that i do I think like even though it's not necessarily in tech like I come from a family of you know really politically active people and I think you need that experience mm -hmm. to be able to survive and do the work that we do mm -hmm. yeah what do you think I think well just further to, I feel like when you know when we started on the game it was very evident to us that we don't know everything and we do look up to our elders and you know strong um 
Aboriginal people and community that have forged that path for us. And we speak very closely with a board named Black Cloud that kind of gives governance to our whole project. And it's made of Karen Jackson, Paolo Bella, Kim Kruger, Jara Caroline Steele and Elizabeth Flynn. And that really gives us the leadership that we need to know that, you know, whilst they don't work in digital spaces, it's actually for us more about the cultural conversations and consultation and knowing that we're going in the right direction because the tech stuff is there you know it, the coding's there the development's there but what's not there is actually the foundation of are we doing this correctly how can we do it better who's this for and mm -hmm. being able to look up to elders and you know people within power and you know strength of the community has been our biggest kind of backbone yeah, yeah. i think that's it tech is just the tool that's right it's yeah, yeah. it's the protocols that's that we right. already have that mm -hmm. is the, it's how we do yeah. it right Perfect. Yeah, I think that's 100% correct. Mm. And there's so many people that work. Um, I guess sometimes it is tirelessly like the elders and like the community members, uh, but they don't get in like, you know, maybe the limelight or they don't want the limelight, no. you know, um, or, or it's, you know, they're working on the peripheries doing things. Um, you know, I was having this conversation before with a friend and it's like, you know, I always call it like the Chicago Bulls of the 95, right? 95 <laughs> Chicago Bulls. Everyone's got a role, right? Like mm. everyone in that team had a, had a role to win a championship. And I think of it like that. I think I like, I think about that a lot because, um, you know, we've got, you know, Michael Jordan's of the scene, but we also, you know, you need to have people, role players on the bench too that are just yeah. working just as hard. Mm. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we've got some incredible, you know, mob out there who are doing some great things, but they don't get a lot of the limelight. Mm -hmm. but they really are doing some great things too in the space around futurisms and or applying their, their, their knowledge. Um, or as you said, maybe they're building protocols and, and building ways mm. and, and thinking of ways of how this could work, but it hasn't come to fruition yet, mm. you know? Um, and they're just, you know, I think there's just so many people that are yeah. that are out there helping, um, and in all different ways. And it doesn't have to be tech. And yeah, it probably exactly. isn't tech. Yeah, um, it is as, as as you know, as as Haley and Kat said, it's probably to do with a lot of other things that just yeah. aren't related to tech at all. Totally. Yeah. I'm hearing a lot of community, and mm -hmm. for people out there, I look around the room and the diversity and probably the different communities that people are a part of. Uh, community, when we think of community to our our people and Indigenous community, um, there's a bit of a, it's a description, it's, it's different, you know, and um, when you're in it and a part of it, you get it. So just explaining to people here what is like the importance or the role of the community like you're saying there's all these different people mm. but how has community yeah really impacted in in the work i mean i feel like this is community mm -hmm. here mm -hmm. um i feel like it's you know it's great to acknowledge that there's no homogenization of culture with Aboriginal culture and mob. And so being able to speak to people from North, South, East and West and get ideas and collaborate. But also I think community is important in these spaces because we can hold each other accountable, I think, in a really, you know, powerful and meaningful way. And if that's done correctly, I think, you know, that's where we get the best outcomes because it isn't just one voice speaking for aboriginal people you know it's a collective and i think that's very important yeah, mm, yeah and that accountability is actually like a, a very generous and loving thing to do yeah like it's not it's not cruel it can even though like it can it can look like it's there's animosity in it but that's a that's a that's a gift that we're giving to each other to to make sure that that mm. culture is strong mm. yeah and i one of the things i really love about that non-homogenous community and, and and i always think back to the pandemic right uh, or the start of the pandemic i shouldn't say the pandemic <laughs> the ongoing yeah. pandemic um is how um this is probably a really deep conversation that we don't have time for but you know the the bullet points essentially are how disruptive that was to to some people and mm. their access to community mm -hmm. right and how important that is to mob and how much of an impact that had, but then also how in some ways and some people we were able to almost create these uh, new communities 
through technology, right, and connecting people across things mm -hmm. like gaming, let's say, for example, um, content creation, streaming, things like this, to almost create new communities and connect with new people of shared, uh, a new mob of shared, um, you know, interests and goals and passions and, and things like this when we were all sitting at home and couldn't go anywhere. And, and I think that's um, really ties to that non-homogenous you know, yeah. homogenous aspect of community because um, these communities, you know, we got, you know, the power of, you know, the mob we're from or the community where we live. Mm. Um, and then there's also power in, in that, disc, you know, being able to connect over those distances as well. Yeah. And that's an interesting thing that I find when we talk about the topic in the sense mm. of like that indigenous futurism because, um, you know, mob all over the place now. Mm, you absolutely. know, being able to connect with them in all different ways has been really, really interesting. I think pandemic, you know, like everything else, accelerated that a little bit. But yeah, I think that's a really interesting 100%. kind of idea now. Beautiful. One thing from community is our storytelling. Mm -hmm. And we come from a very oral history. Mm -hmm. Our stories weren't documented. We didn't see them. Um, we, our country, held a lot of that, mm -hmm. that sacredness, the storytelling, the song lines. So, what does storytelling of Indigenous culture? Mm -hmm. How is that looking and integrating and merging through the digital way? Um, I think from our, I think, you know, looking at future folklore as a premise, I think that kind of pertains to the idea that we can live in this location based but nondescript location of future fantasy and future placemaking. But I think it also allows for us to kind of allow Aboriginal people to, or, you know, Indigenous people and mob to write new stories as well um, and to not have to think about Aboriginal culture as only being a retrospective idea mm -hmm. that only exists in this history that is only this big when it's really this big and it can be this big in mm -hmm. the future. You know, I think it's like actually creating more space for new stories, new narratives based from a very, you know, strong cultural tie that I find really exciting about the project that not only we're working in but the concept of black futurism in that space mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah and it's such a like a radical and expansive thing like yeah. if you're doing with future folklore like it's it's really like kind of smashing not only our own perceptions of what we're capable of but i guess like out those outward perceptions of what you know indigenous mob can mm -hmm. do or can be yeah i think there's something like really powerful and be able to do that and like it, using technology again technology is just the tool but that that storytelling medium in in that kind of radical way i think it's so cool mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's an interesting topic right storytelling i've been thinking about it mm. uh, like a lot lately um and and i 100 percent agree i think that that's the i mean that's the personal thing as well but i love the space of Science fiction, and I know we really shouldn't call it fantasy because it kind of is fantasy, but, um, <laughs> you know, where could we be in 100 years? That's kind of fantasy. Um, <laughs> but um, one of the things that I've been thinking about, I'm just going to drop my little, my little thing in here about the storytelling is sometimes I do think there is that preconceived notion because we are black followers, we're storytellers. That's the way we are, right? That's the way the stories were passed down but doesn't mean we should share that story with you. Mm. Yeah. You know, I've been thinking about this topic of um, cultural access. Mm. And so um, this is why I like indigenous futurism because we can be creative in a space without breaching or even having to, um, you know, go back and have a look at whether or not there's, there's a, there's a, a protocol we need to follow here around cultural access. Yeah. And I think about this primarily because of Facebook and yes that's right dirty facebook um and, but i do this because we saw this happen with technology in, in most of, this is my observation um as technology came in and we started to use facebook and all you know and all different types of social media facebook particularly because mob love facebook mm -hmm. um there were things being shared on there that probably shouldn't have been shared on there mm. you know what i mean and that got me thinking like mm. oh that's access to culture that yeah. a lot of people now have yeah. that really shouldn't have happened mm. 
Mm. That's not for me to decide though. Yeah. It's just my observation. Yeah. But then it got me thinking about stories. Well, how many of our stories have been shared? But, you know, good ways. There's pros and cons, but I, yeah. No, so true. this is what I love about the indigenous, you know, back to the, you know, when we're talking mm. about this futurism. We can, we have this space to tell stories and really um, embrace that the mm. storytelling aspect of our culture mm. um, and and dream big mm. and but also look back mm. um, but I also hope not share too much of mm. I think we've already shared enough we've already given enough mm. yeah we shouldn't have to really give any more you know mm. so let's um Let's, I don't know. I don't know. This is my personal perspective. Go put that stuff in the vault, maybe, and I keep that for mob only. But, yeah. but um, I, you know, I think there's, again, I think this really just what I'm trying saying is I kind of building on what Haley was saying about. It's about the protocols. It's yeah. about mm. yeah. there's so much work to do still, yeah. protocols and processes and framework and yeah. you know I guess these are all Westernized words for just you know putting it putting that culture in place in this space but yeah. yeah but you're right though like with storytelling you know we can share stories and we can share knowledge but it's how like what do you want it for you know what are you going to do mm. with it you how's know it being consumed? yeah how's it being consumed yeah. and why yeah. you're just going to listen to it take it regurgitate mm. it and think that you're woke like it's not yeah. for you you <laughs> yeah. know what i mean like totally yeah yeah and that's the tricky thing with a lot of the platforms that we use and the technologies were designed to for surveillance to mine data to capture as many stories yeah. as possible and we need to be really careful that we're operating under a system that wants to capture and collect and that's it's it's deeply capitalist and mm. western and colonialist and but that's just the system that we're working under mm. so it's like do we burn it down and <laughs> create something <laughs> new or or like how do we live inside it in a, in a way that works well how do we embed yeah. protocols into the stuff that we do i think that's what we, you do well mm -hmm. perfect segue into digital colonialism mm -hmm. and data sovereignty there's some more big words <laughs> um what does that what does that look like and how how have you been able to manage a fine balance of protecting things that are sacred in that story and honoring community mm -hmm. and culture and history mm -hmm. in a way that you're still navigating through very colonized uh, you know western systems mm -hmm. Um, and finding that balance. I mean, within the game, it's something we're navigating ongoing. Yeah. It happens constantly where, you know, we, we are hit with a scenario where, you know, we have to mitigate how are we being complicit with digital sovereignty or digital colonialism. I think a lot of it for us is just about the speed at which we work, the consulting, who we work with, the stories we tell, who those stories come from and who we're making the game for, which is Aboriginal people and mob. That mm. is our core audience. That is who this game is for. But I really don't have the big answers in that space. Mm. Like I think, you know, this is still framework that's being discussed and built. And I think what Ben was touching on before is really valid and important around, mm. you know, platforms like Instagram and social media and Facebook and how stories are being shared, even to the point of people sharing, um, you know, infographics around really sensitive cultural trauma or importance and things, you know, what, what is the buy-in? What is this creating? What is it allowing people to feel like they're inputting into decolonizing structures through digital sharing, et cetera? Mm. But what is the actual real life outcomes, you know? Yeah, and who's profiting? Yeah, yeah, who's yeah, profiting, yeah, exactly. Yes, indeed. Mm. This is your topic, Kat. Like really, this is like <laughs> e e e digital activism and digital rights. It's, it's big. It's, it's um, huge. Yeah, yeah it's, it's massive. It's hard to know where to start, but I think we've already been talking about mm. this as well. Like it, it comes down to protocol and it comes down to community and but the but recognizing again, so digital colonialism and not to 
treat it like a metaphor, like it's it's colonialism just happening in a digital space. Mm -hmm. um, and so much of the technology that we use is not only like acts of colonization and perpetual colonization mm. of indigenous peoples but you know it's it's also mining materials from country to create machines and to create the computers in our pockets and the data mm -hmm. centers where everything's stored and then what is then our ongoing responsibility to country to kind of reconcile and also exist on inside that system uh, again mm. And and recognizing again that there are these platforms, you know, whether it's Instagram or Facebook, they're they're owned by big tech companies that are, you know, exploiting labor in the global south, and and again just mm. like profiting off the that that colonialism, that ongoing colonialism. So, um, it's it's a it's a tough, it's a big topic, but I think mm -hmm. again like that's why it's so important for us to fall back on protocols and embed those protocols mm -hmm. into everything that we do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and to, no, go ahead. Yeah. Did you have something to add, Ben? I was going to say, just with the, with the the when we talk about in the digital colonialism, the great thing out, I just how Sarah will say, the great thing is digital activism. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. Like this, That's right. this is where, uh, you know, uh, we start to see some of the great things being done in that space as well. Mm. Um, and tying right back to the first thing we said, it's not always about people in tech necessarily, but like activism and things like mm. that's happening out here on the streets. It's also happening in digital spaces. Um, and, and data sovereignty is a real tough one. It's mm. not tough as a concept or as a technology. I think that's fairly well understood, the, the idea of data sovereignty. But in practicality, yeah. in practicality, it's not that easy. Yeah. You know, they're, you know, it's, it's a really um, um, almost a buzzword. It's mm. nice to say, great idea, theoretically amazing, but then no one bothers to put in any work into mm. actually how we're going to achieve that. Mm. Um, and so that's a really, really interesting topic, which I think has been around for a while and really hasn't mm. made much, much room, but uh, much movement or much growth. But, um, you know, I think that the more, the more indigenous peoples that are in charge mm. of those things, then we will start to see a buy-in. Mm -hmm. We will start to see movement because it's actually more than a, I love this because it's a cool technology. Mm. It's, I love this because it's for my mob, for yeah. my community. Mm. There's much more buy-in mm -hmm. from that. So, you know, we circle back around to representation and opportunities and more mob in the space. Yeah. 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 Mm. And you're right. There's, it's, it's simple. Everything that you put out there is, mm. it's almost like, who owns it then? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. You know, and then it? it's, it's, yeah. it's mine, it's ours, it's, it's, it's there, it's the clouds, it's mm. not ours. Yeah. <laughs> um, for me, what is it that, you know, I'm, I'm the person that's in the community mm. uh, enjoying, you know, and kind of benefiting from the creation of, of you know, what you're doing. What can community do? <laughs> people in the audience and people that are you know viewers or supporters in in that space that how can we continue to support decolonizing systems or having the voice of you know what's there and how to navigate it you know respectfully as well because like you said what's out there is some some quite mm. you know sacred stuff or sensitive stuff mm. and how can people be a support in that process it's i feel like with i mean for us more it's around i think funding bodies more creating space mm. and actually creating space for people to have the capacity to be creative and think about black futurism instead of just living in the now and dealing day in and day out with you know racist colonial structures so you know BA, being able to from a community point of view I feel like it's actually more systemic for us with the help I think community can support and you know really engage with Aboriginal led organizations and companies and try and listen and I think there's also 
the financial aspect from the kind of bigger corporations and the funding partners and bodies that can really start to put their money where their mouths are and invest in spaces that allow for there to be autonomy and capacity for people to just be creative and make mm. work. Mm. Definitely. Yeah. 100%, 100%. Yeah. I'm interested to like for for Guck for future folklore, but there will be I imagine there's loads of companies who would love to put their name on your work and be mm. like, oh yeah, I support that and maybe it comes with money or, or support mm. or whatever like whatever that looks like, but is there it, what what is good ways look like it's really hard i feel like you know for us it's basically not trying to attach any caveats to the work mm -hmm. and it's actually just saying we want to support this because we understand that you have done the work in this space and we'd also like to collaborate and learn from you, you know, and actually kind of leaning more into our processes and protocols instead of wanting us to fit into theirs. So, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, that's that's the hardest struggle at the moment, I think, ongoing with any big project. And you, got, you would both know this from your work as well is just around there's a lot of people that want to offer money and there's a lot of people that want to put their logo on work but it also comes with t's and c's and that's where it starts to become an issue because it start it stops being culturally safe then mm. yeah mm. i'd say like i mean tech is the same yeah it's it's i you know you see a lot of companies who you know, create a, a a job for one mob in the mm. in the organization like yeah we fixed racism but it's <laughs> it's it's so much more to fund fund initiatives to mm. but then also give the autonomy and agency mm. to mob to figure out what's the right way to engage with community and what's what mm. does uh, uh that kind of like self um self actualization 100 percent look like yep mm. Without no, being absolutely. to compromise ourselves in white spaces. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, it's self determination versus yeah. selfishness, right? Like, yeah. mm -hmm. honestly, we, we, let's straight talk. You know, we've seen this. There's communities like out there who are like, we want to create. We want to digitize our stories because we understand that young mob mm. uh, don't want to sit down and listen anymore. They want to do this in virtual reality. Let's say, for example, um, and so white orcs come in and go, "That's a great way for us to make money." Mm -hmm. And that's how they approach it. So, you know, we'll charge you $10,000 a day to do VR workshops. And mm -hmm. it's like, hang on a second. Couldn't we just got the money to train the community so they can create their own VR? Exactly. You yeah, know what I mean? Yeah. Like it's, it's always seen through that colonial lens. It's always seen through that what can I get out of indigenous culture lens. Exactly as you said. Mm -hmm. It's about empowering the communities to be able to make their own decisions. And, and, mm -hmm. and then, you know, you don't have to worry. You don't have to sit there as an indigenous person and say, Oh, I don't know how to engage with blackfellas because yeah. blackfellas know how to engage with blackfellas, so that'll be fine. Exactly. You know, yeah. like, but we have to empower that. We have to uh, really doubling down on what both of you said. You know, investment, no strings attached, shared vision, really understanding that it's about you know, um, you know, empowering the community so they can make their own decisions, right, and do it their way uh, without your influence. It's also I mean, it's not just trying to plug in to what it already exists. Yeah. You know, it's actually believing in what doesn't exist and what is starting to exist. And I think um, it's also about long-term investment in actually sustainable career paths. You know, I've worked in a lot of different organizations and I think the general tone and theme is there is this fear of working with black fellows or mob or, mm. you know, even mm. unconscious. It's just this learned internalized fear of doing something wrong. But, you know, if, if we actually invest in skill upskilling or teaching or, you know, mm -hmm. long-term pathways for young Aboriginal creatives or professionals, when you have more Aboriginal people in a building, it organically just starts to make sense. It mm. doesn't feel scary because it's just your peers, you know? It's, it's that sort of mindset that I think really needs to shift and it's quite an mm. obvious statement, but it really doesn't happen a lot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Simple, open the door. Yeah. hundred percent. Give people a seat yeah. at the space. Um, Not yeah. just a five minute seat. Yeah. You know, yeah. like an yeah. hour. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And the power to change the space too. Like, yeah. Yeah. Not just, not just a seat and then go, oh, yeah. here you go. Yeah. yeah. 
but then actually again self-determination mm-hmm. yeah, 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 yeah. to say like okay uh, now i'm inside this space but the space needs to change mm-hmm. yeah if we want to be safe for the rest of our mob mm-hmm. centering our mob yeah. in the center yeah. that we don't have to then change or go in a system that isn't actually wasn't built for us or yeah. was mm-hmm. you know to and keep us um outside so it's it is really changing it from the inside out and allowing communities to create their own communities in these spaces. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Before we go to questions, I want to hear from each of you of what's been one of the biggest highlights within this work that you've you've seen or you've achieved um, or that has had a ripple effect within the community from the work that you've do, done? Uh, I think working on Future Folklore at Gark, it's actually just seeing the growth within the team that we have, and that's all through their own self-determination and just being able to witness what happens when there is an Aboriginal-led space and how a project can actually work. Um, you know, there's so many learnings still to happen, but, you know, everyone that works on this project is so insanely talented and incredible and wonderful and you know they're all they're always growing their practice and evolving their practice and i think just being able to witness that um and you know being able to watch that evolve has been really incredible and that's you know just knowing that if that can even be you know something that's on the radar of organizations that put money or time or energy or support behind these sort of practices and spaces like that to me it could be the ripple effect you know Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah yeah i think similarly for me it's the it's the new communities have sprung up and the new connections Mm. and and seeing how in empowering that can be to watch people find each other and and create things together and and even seeing like how how cool it is to see an ex- exhibition like this mm. bringing together artists in a, in a way that we haven't seen before mm. and creating things that are totally new and then but I, I feel like there's been more and more of that over the last few years in a way that's really exciting mm. so that's I think that momentum mm. is what's been really cool to see I agree, <laughs> um, but I will give you a specific example because I have a very specific highlight. Mm. Um, just because um, it it it's such a contrast to how I grew up, um, but it it's just basically exactly everything that you know Kat and Haley just said was finding those partners who want to be partners that are not indigenous whether they're organizations or people mm. finding those people who want to be partners on the journey want to support and realize that there's a lot of work to be done and that they can contribute no matter how big or small to that work <laughs> and um and in and, and, and last year the the exact example that i have was um, one of the large gaming international gaming organizations supporting to have two young indigenous kids 12 years old and their mum because <laughs> you're going to have a parent <laughs> to fly all the way to California to attend indigenous tech conference wow. because their passion after school was making games not playing sport and then in their country town they had no programs for that to mm. support that mm. and it's a that's a very particular highlight for me because we did that mm. we worked hard to get that um that company had to work hard to get that across the line to show why that was a value to the organization yeah. um but most importantly it was a huge value to those two young mm. kids who when i was 12 years old mm. that never existed mm. right a long time ago now but they yeah. never existed um and yeah, that's uh, that was my particular highlight from you know one of my particular highlights from last year because 
it just creates so much opportunity for young people mm-hmm. to, to continue to follow those dreams and passions, even though they live in country and, the, you know, on country, out on, in the country of, you know, New South Wales, and we might call it, um, where there's no programs to support their, their dreams mm-hmm. locally. Mm-hmm. So Amazing. Mm. Thank you so much. Thank you and give it up to the panellists. <laughs> this has been brilliant. Just handing it over to the audience is there any questions yes uh, what advice would you give to young people who are interested in accessing what advice would the panelist uh, give to young people thank you for that question do you want me to go yeah go <laughs> <laughs> um it sounds really simple to say, but like not not to give up, not to not to think, even though you may only be the the, the only Indigenous, um, you know, young person in the room, in the class, in the workplace, you are actually not alone. There there is a, a whole community of Indigenous people in tech, um, with so. Um, much talent and experience and passion um, that it sounds kind of so simple to say you're not alone but um, it's really what it what it kind of feels like and 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 you're not um, sure there's not a million of us <laughs> but um, but the community is is actually really incredible and supportive mm. and so um, you know, if there's if you can find a way to reach out, whether it's at events like this or mm-hmm. or on social medias or you know, um, you know, do so because um, you know there's there's heaps of other mob out there that are interested, and honestly, it's what it feels like. You know, it always feels like that. Like uh, mm-hmm. um, until you find your 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 community, right? Mm-hmm. You do honestly feel like you're the only person, right? So mm-hmm. yeah. yeah. Yeah, and we're always trying to like plug new people into the community. But then yeah. once you're in, like you you're in. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. You're in. Yeah, you're in. You're in. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely, and you know it can be any dream, any passion. You know, like what mm. the the community that you know we've been able to build. Uh, I mentioned this right over the pandemic, especially digitally. You know. Mm. A lot of that's content creators, a lot of that's streamers or mm. writers or, mm. you know, maybe we met because we're partnering in different organizations or we're doing projects together and, um, you know, it almost always feels like, oh, wow, I didn't know there was a black fella doing that. Mm. You know, like we just have to, you know, we're constantly finding, but we're constantly growing. Mm. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. I'm wondering what language you're getting. Um, that's to be determined. Mm-hmm. We're still working through, I guess, it's because it's future folklore, it's existing in a kind of uh, nondescript location. So it's not really attached or pertaining to any one mob or land. Um, so the language conversation is probably not where we're at quite yet, but um, 2024. <laughs> <laughs> Stay tuned. Yes. <laughs> Watch the space out oh, at the back. Hmm. 
I can answer this one. Yeah. I'm a part of the panel now. Let's go. Uh, uh, great question. Not so much in the context of uh, the digital space, but in general, um, there is, again, people out there that are wanting to not tokenize the education and continue to say, here's what somebody writ, here's the script, and we just keep passing it down and there's no change, there's no change within internal, internally. So um, for me, it's actually sitting down. I've had the opportunity to sit down with somebody, a, a lecturer, a teacher in university, um, RMIT, not a shout out at all. But, you know, it's <laughs> like uh, it's having those people who are, who are wanting to create the conversation or the art piece in that educational topic or space that is actually delivered with knowledge, with experience, with the real life story or it is Indigenous led hmm. and spoken from um, and creating actual content that is well correct or followed from protocols mm. and we're having these it's slowly it's not enough we've got a long way to go but it's it's having indigenous people in communities per se sitting with academic lecturers in those spaces and unfortunately sometimes it has to come from the top up or you know that's the that's the mm. colonial system it's very hierarchy mm. pyramid shape built um that sometimes all it takes is one person to come out of the system and it you know and then we just continue to plant new seeds and new growth comes in um so that's that was my experience of that yeah. um i'll hand over to the real panelist here yeah I feel so unequipped to like decolonize the academy. Yeah, in five minutes. Yeah, I think go. if you like how to show up outside of institutions, I think it's actually yeah. seeking out information and seeing who that information was created by, mm -hmm. as Tasha was saying. You know, who wrote this? Who did they write it for? If a white person wrote a piece about Aboriginal art, it's probably not going to tell you much about Aboriginal art. You know, mm. it's just actually doing some investigating. And, you know, I know that can be overwhelming if you don't know where to look yeah. and it's hard and I don't, couldn't direct you right now. Mm. <laughs> but I guess that's just something to think about when you are trying to learn more. Yeah. I think the basic thing is asking the question. Yeah asking where's the resource sourced from mm -hmm. um, and also expressing the desires of if we're learning about certain topics that we want to have actual information that's relevant. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's aligned with what the topic is. So exactly. yeah. yeah, you have the power basically. Mm -hmm. You have the power mm. to change. And I believe everybody, whatever position you're in, whatever space, um, you have the power to, to really drive something. And if there's enough of those driving in that direction, mm. then, then something has to, has to respond or react to it. Yeah. yeah, you made a good point earlier about like uh, yeah, Aboriginal cultures aren't homogenous. Mm. You're not going to get one singular opinion or one singular culture. Mm -hmm. you know, indigenous cultures aren't monolithic, so it's it's easy to have you know your your one token lecturer come in and give you an opinion or give you a direction, but to be able to seek out other mm. opinions and other visions and other cultures is is. I know it's a lot more work, but it's so much more, yeah, important and closer to, yeah, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. closer to good ways. And, and each each university, well, should have <laughs> the the only safe space for black fellows in the academy, in my opinion, and that's the indigenous unit. Yeah, and uh, it certainly was the only safe space for me at university, mm -hmm. and. Um, they're not there to educate you, for sure, but um, they're there to support the students. But um, with the right questions and the right intent, they might be able to help too. Um, 
And then the only other thing, I, only other place I can really think of that's shaking that up is maybe ICR. There's an ICRR, Centre for Race Research, mm-hmm. um, in um, Queensland. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't know exactly where it is, but um, <laughs> and, and I think that's in a sense come out of that. So you can look up ICRR on socials, but I think the, the whole point of that is it's like Centre for Race Research or something like mm. that, or Racial Racism Research or something like that, something like that. but basically mm. a place to do academia for mob, by mob, outside of academia um, because academia is a problematic topic. Mm. Yeah, I was just going to say that be the educator and seek your own education. Mm. If you're not getting it inside the classroom, then maybe you need to go somewhere else for the content that you're yeah. searching for. Mm. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, there's definitely. communities. There's, there's all the communities that have... A, you know, world full of knowledge. So thank you for that question. Probably have, yeah, we're here. Um, I think a lot of the current dialogue of like, a lot of the limited consultation that we have, mm-hmm. um, like Australian Indigenous people is centered on um, like ancient knowledge, I guess, like particularly in climate change and land management there's a lot of talking about um, like Indigenous burning rituals and stuff. Do you feel like people Great question. Mm. I think it kind of aids it in a way because it allows us to exist in this futurism space and, like I said before, like not be seen as if culture is only retrospective. Mm. And I think that's kind of almost pushing against the idea that that is the box that Indigenous culture lives in. Mm -hmm. Um, But it definitely, you know, obviously there is this preconceived notion, I think, that all we know about is dream time and it's like <laughs> that's not true you know there's, yeah, yeah, there's yeah. so many other aspects yeah you know what i mean like, they ignores you know contem- contemporary culture and ignores that kind of like futurism mm. that we're capable of uh yeah there's a there's a weird kind of mysticism around <laughs> that like ancient <laughs> aboriginal culture that a lot of white people like but um yeah i i think it's i mean it's part of our sovereignty and self-determination to embody those other cultures and those mm. other other types of being. By also acknowledging that culture as well, like no one's trying to, yeah. you know, erase any part of our culture. It's all important. It's all mm. part of the tapestry. It's just about also having the space to have active live culture. We're a living culture, you know. It's mm. about being able to engage with this essence of this is not history this is actually a living organism and it's the land and it's us you know i would also add to that um the dialogue changing the perspective that everything in human evolution as a culture of human race has actually stemmed from everything well australian indigenous and indigenous globally yeah have been doing and have done exactly Mm. our doctors our teachers our chefs our nurses our midwives uh land management land management Mm. farmers like that has come from the concepts Mm. that were very you know simplified and (laughs) very land focused that i think we forget that Mm. we're actually a part of it not separate from it Mm -hmm. and just these concepts have evolved with the forms of modern day you know what the future looks like the future is now Mm -hmm. and how we are evolving now is is what that will look like and understanding that the ancient or the history of you know first nations people has you know been through the streamline ever since and what we're doing now is you know and what we're creating for tomorrow but this is black futurism too like my great great grandfather you know started the day of mourning with the apa he was the accountant um you know and 
where I am now in my practice as an Aboriginal woman and a proud Wiradjuri woman, like this is black futurism to him. Do you know what I mean? So it's always this narrative where we're constantly kind of moving through. It's just around, you know, this isn't enough. Mm. So it's just about that conversation having context, I think. Mm. And, and I agree. <laughs> But we were talking about this before when I was doing my warm up. We were doing, I was doing my warm up yarn. Um, honestly, sometimes it does feel like there's only two things people want to know about, right? Yeah. It's about culture, the dreaming, or your trauma. Yeah. That's all they want to know about. Um, and I was telling Kat and Haley this little yarn before, right? About I'm gonna get my I'm gonna get my points in here. Um, you know what's important going forward, right? So uh, when we talk about black futurisms and um indigenous futurisms and and it's it's really quite straightforward it's land back capital and power mm -hmm. okay that's really that straightforward in my opinion mm -hmm. i was very privileged to be able to talk to chief scientist kathy foley last year and one of the things i said to kathy foley was you know new south wales puts out this great 20-year vision for um digital futures and technology and the only time black fellows were mentioned was in the acknowledgement of country on the document. They didn't mention us when it came to ag tech. They didn't mention any more when it came to renewable energies, uh, managing sea country, um, sky country, um, manufacturing, um, hyper rail, all of that stuff is on black fellow land, right? So we go back to my first point, land back. And then we can start to have a bl like an honest black future, right, for ourselves. Um, and it's not a dig at the chief scientist at all. It's just how it is for us, mm. right? We're not even a part, not even a consideration in the topic of future outside of an acknowledgement. Mm -hmm. mm. That's it. Sorry, last, I don't mean to bring everyone down now. Sorry. We're going to just take the, sorry, the last <laughs> question up the back there. Yep, no, yep, that's you. <laughs> You all got your business cards? Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's it. Yeah. Um, it's a good question. Um, I mean, yes, the answer is yes, there is. there are ways. Um, it's going to be specific to the businesses and the, and the work that you're looking for mm -hmm. and to whether or not there is actually an authentic indigenous business that's right i'm saying it right now not just supply nation certified we're not mm -hmm. counting them mm -mm. Uh, sorry <laughs> on the soapbox again but um um just because they may not have had the opportunity to build that business idea out okay so again this is the, the systemic levels of of access opportunity so um what you're exactly looking for may not be there right now um, it may be, but it just may not be. Um, so in that instance, what can you do? You can um, obviously reach out, right? Um, we may be able to connect you with one of the organizations that we, that we work with or an organization that we know. Um, alternatively, it's how can you potentially support and invest in those hmm. places that are looking to, to become something? Because right now, the inv Haley mentioned this before too. The investment models and the way that investment is done is not great. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of investment goes to companies who get $33 million from the government every year. <coughs> we know who you are. And um, they don't need it. Mm. 
right? That could have gone to community org or a startup black org, right? That uh, Blackfellow org that um, really could have been that organization that was able to bring not just cultural consultation, um, but actually tech skills along with it and expertise, um, but it's very hard for them to exist. Um, so um, it could go either way really, um, to be honest, but yeah, it really I depends think on what you're looking for. Also though, just to that, I think it's also about not just when there's a project that pertains to indigenous culture or indigenous practice engaging i think hire black people <laughs> like hire aboriginal staff and your network will grow mm -hmm. yeah, that's, that's kind really of what true. i think about any org it's like don't just work with black people in black space create black space yeah that's mm -hmm. really fundamentally what will systemically start to make shifts so you should just hire a black person tomorrow like literally <laughs> <laughs> like that's yeah. you know True, yeah. true. <laughs> and, you know, please come and get their contacts and connections. There's yeah. so much more that these mob know. And if anyone does have any other questions, um, some of them are here for the night, so they're not <laughs> flying. They've got to fly out tomorrow. So um, they'll be around. Uh, but, no, come and, you know, say hello to them yourself personally. But thank you so much for coming and giving up to the Thank you. Know, thank you. Uh, Hayley. Thanks, Tasha. Thank you, Tash, as well.